Assalamu alaikum everyone. I hope you're having a good time. We have been seeing a lot of great talks uh, from yesterday. So my topic today is uh, about my experiences when building a chat service in Node.js. So we recently, uh, not really recently, we decided to build a chat messaging service uh, in the Dhaka office. So this talk is actually about lessons I learned when building this chat service and uh, things that I want to share with my fellow developers. So uh, I'm Tangri Hassan. I work at Monster Lab Bangladesh as a software architect. I've been here for uh, almost five years. It will be five years this June. So this picture is actually from a pre-pandemic barbecue. <laughs> I really miss those times when we could uh, go out and have have nice barbecues with our friends. So the reason we built this chat messaging service is basically due to um, demand from different projects and different teams because we we found out that a lot of a lot of the projects and a lot of the softwares that we build. Uh, usually have this messaging service uh, or messaging um, feature. So at that time, we decided uh, that we wanted to build something that is reusable and we can just plug and play it so that we can use it in uh, multiple projects and multiple teams can easily uh, configure and deploy these. So the key requirements for our service was that it has to be easy it has to be easy to use because a lot of the times that, uh, that we face, a lot of the times that we want to integrate a different service or, a, or an external service to our software, we find out that it's sometimes not easy to use because the APIs, either the APIs are cluttered or the uh, documentation is not proper or um, the deployment is rather difficult if it's self-hosted uh, and if it's not self-hosted, sometimes we find out that uh, there are errors that we cannot even debug because uh, the maintainers uh, are like from an external uh, SaaS project or something. So we have faced these kind of issues in the past when we have used uh, services from other prof providers and our developers face that we uh, find out some errors are happening, which are like 500 internal server errors, and we, we can't really debug what's going on. So we also, uh, in some cases, we also tried to contact the service providers, but uh, we faced a lot of issues and a lot of delays. So the next requirement was it has to be highly maintainable. So because we were investing in such a product, we wanted it to be highly maintainable So how, um, so that our maintainers and contributors can easily maintain the software for a long time, even after the core contributors are, or the core maintainers have moved on or have moved to different projects and are not available uh, at, at the point in time. For example, it can be three years later, four years later, then that we have to still maintain the project. Uh, and we also wanted the external interfaces or the external um, services that we will be using in this chat service to be plug and play. We want to easily be able to replace the logger, the monitoring tool, the database, the queue system, etc. And we want to we want them uh, to be easily configurable. Like we don't want developers to figure out how something was written just by looking at the code. We wanted it to be abstracted. We wanted everything which is external, which is not a business logic to be um, abstracted away so that it doesn't have any effect on the uh, use cases. So whenever whenever we want, we ask the uh, team to integrate another service in the project, it kind of boils down to this because uh, you never know when it's going to blow up. So let me uh, just share how we made, how we tried to make their lives easier. So we decided from the get go that we will build SDKs. We will not rely solely on APIs. So 
So we, uh, although although we have our very detailed documentation of the APIs, we still didn't want developers to go through them. We wanted that to be the fallback. We wanted them to use the SDKs as much as possible. And if there is any issue, we wanted the uh, we wanted the developer to go through the documentation or talk, talk to us so that we can improve the SDKs. So we have created interfaces and also abstractions in our SDKs. We wanted it to be, be like as easy as it can be. For example, let me just um, share this one story. So when when we try to integrate uh, another SDK into our uh, front end code, we face a lot of problems. So the problems occur when you don't really understand what the request and response types are going to be. So you have to simultaneously integrate the SDK. You have to go through the documentation of the SDK. You also have to go through the documentation of the API. So we wanted to eliminate all of this. And so we decided to use TypeScript for the web application SDK. Uh, and we created interfaces so that the developers can just, you know, uh, write message dot and they will get all of the um, attributes right there and they will not have to go through the documentation. But apart from this, we still decided to write clear and concise documentation. And another ease of use is for the DevOps team. So we wanted the deployment to be as smooth as possible. So we used Docker. We plan to also write the Kubernetes files, but we don't have it right now as we highly rely on Docker at the moment. So we have we have written the Docker files. We also have Terraform modules for this specific applications with all its components. So in any project, if you have a Terraform code, you can easily include these modules into your code and you will have uh, your entire infrastructure up and running with this chat service. So uh, let me just give a reminder of uh, this talk, it's not actually about the chat service itself, but it's kind of about how how you guys can um, maybe deploy or build another another standalone service, and maybe you can have some uh, guidance or uh, some learning capabilities from from this. So next, I want to move on to the maintainability side. So this is a uh, rather bigger topic that I want to talk about. So we chose Node.js. Uh, th there has been several reasons, but we decided to go Node.js solely depending on the fact that we were e we were um, we were kind of relatively easier with hands-on experience in Node.js. So and there are also a lot of other um, great features for Node.js that I'm going to talk about later. So we also went ahead with clean architecture. We decided to use Express.js and not any other any framework uh, or any project structure, opinionated project structure for our Node.js code. But we decided to create a clean architecture project structure. So those of you who do not do not really know uh, about clean architecture, I'm going to describe it a bit further later later on. So we chose Node.js mainly due to these three facts. So, so it's relatively easy. It's relatively easy to learn because I myself started my journey as a front end engineer at Monster Lab. So those who know me know, know me as Tanvi.js because I have been working uh, in front end part, Angular, we, uh, when I joined Monster Lab, but I switch to backend uh, slowly. So now I'm heavily invested in backend architecture and backend systems. So I kind of understood how this, uh, how using Node.js can help us with getting contributors or getting um, help from front end engineers who can easily maintain the project down the line. Also Node.js has a pretty good performance benchmark as all of you may know already because of the V8 engine and um, recently. So this one part is like, 
kind of debatable because it does not scale it might not scale vertically as much as you would want it to for certain uh, certain cases but in our case we would rather have it scale horizontally uh, and not vertically so that's why we chose uh, that's why high performance of node.js um, single threaded is perfect for us and also node.js projects are very very quick to develop and uh, release this is another reason we went, went with it so we decided to write all our code in typescript uh, there is also another funny story so i when typescript first came out i was very skeptical and i did not did not really like the idea of it i kind of was coding with javascript uh, javascript es6 and flow at the time but then slowly I, as i as i started uh, working with typescript i found that it's way way better in a lot of ways so one major reason that i really like typescript is because you can create abstractions very easily just like any other object oriented language for example we can write interfaces and we can depend on these interfaces so that was a key reason that i use typescript basically everywhere so let's move on to the architecture side of things uh, those who do not know the clean architecture i highly highly recommend you to go through it uh, there is there is a book uh, by robert c martin uncle bob uh, which talks about clean architecture and you can also visit the visit the url at the bottom bottom of the slide to get a better picture but to go through an overview in this way of um, designing your software the innermost parts are the core parts of your pro of your software so entities are the are the core part of the software and the uh, as you go as you go in, into the this is also called uh, this can also be described as an onion architecture or a hexagonal architecture so as you go inside the dependencies will slowly uh, like get less and less so for example entities do not know about the use cases entities do not know about the controllers entities are generic basic objects nothing more nothing more so they will not even have database specific um, annotations because entity these are our domain objects and then we go to use cases use cases are all our business logic every single business logic will reside in use case so you can also say that um, will validation reside in use case or entities so there is a difference uh, different types of validations for example uh, let me just point two types one is a very generic entity validation for example you want all your urls to be of a specific um, specific to meet a specific criteria so you can use this url validation in your entities because across the board it's the same but if it depends on the business logic if the url validation depends on the business logic uh, if it changes then it has to go into the use cases then you have the controller so again use cases have no idea what the controllers are uh, controllers can be of different types it can be a view it can be a json handler it can be uh, a cli handler it can be a lot of things and the controller will basically handle all the inputs and outputs and parse them and make them generic and then pass it to the use cases so use cases will only depend on entities and other services or helpers not they will have no idea about express um, request object or express response object or how to behave when a cli command is passed those will be handled in the controllers so in that way you have the external interfaces at the topmost layer so external interfaces will have all of the other things that you want to uh, integrate with your application these will have no effect these should have no effect on any of your business logic or anything if you can manage if you can manage this in such a way then you can easily change your you can easily change all of your um, uh, business logic or use cases without 
sorry, you can easily change all of your external interfaces without having any effect on your use cases. So your business logic, you don't have to touch your business logic uh, to change your database. You can, you can write abstractions for repository layer and depending on that, you can just plug and play your database, uh, whether you want MongoDB or you want MySQL, your use case will only know find messages, that's it, or send or create message. And the repository layer will do the rest whichever you plug in by configuration. So let me show a sample, a sample folder structure that I followed or we followed in our project. So this is not the exact one, but it's kind of similar. So as you can see at the topmost layer, you have the source folder where you have all of these things. So this is also called, this can also be no, uh, called as a screaming architecture. It screams of like what the, what this software does. So as you can see at the topmost layer, you have messaging, you have the models, you have the repository. So the more, the, uh, if I follow the clean architecture, you can see the models are of my entities. So these will only contain uh, generic JavaScript objects, nothing else or classes. Basically th these are classes. So then you have your, the use cases, the, uh, so these will only depend on the models and these will have abstractions for the repository. Uh, another note, I did not include the test files, but I prefer to keep the test files alongside the uh, main TypeScript files. So in this case, you will have the message validator.spec.ts, that will be the test file. And then you have the delivery mechanism. So delivery uh, why i call it delivery is because it can contain different types for example you will see uh, i will again see, show this uh, later on that we also have cli types of delivery so that's why we have um, this kind of folder structure which says http so these handlers and routers will contain only controller controller logic nothing nothing else they will uh, invoke the services and in that way, the flow will uh, go on. And lastly, we have the external interface or database layer. So here you can see we have uh, MongoDB in, in another folder. So what you can, uh, what I, I did when starting this project, I did not uh, still fixate on which database to use. So what I did was we used in memory, in memory implementation we wrote all of the repository interface around the in-memory implementation, and then we just replaced it. We replaced it with MongoDB. We implemented the I repository, and everything kind of worked in that way. So next I want to talk about the plug and play facility. So as you already saw, if we use the external interfaces, external APIs with abstraction, we can easily replace them just using configuration. So, uh, and teams can select what they want to use in their project. This, uh, this is mainly because this, this chat service is kind of like an external service, but we built it in house, but we wanted the team to decide which, which uh, for example, database, which search engine, which monitoring tool. We provided some built-ins. For example, we provided APM APIs, as monitoring tools, but you can replace it. We provided um, uh, notifiers like Pusher, but you can replace it because all of these just implement basic interfaces which accept and return uh, domain objects. So here I show another uh, module which is called searching. So here you can see it has a CLI de delivery mechanism and it has all of these search engines. So this uh, this I am showing because I just wanted to show the interface how we uh, decided to implement it. So as you can see, we pass domain object this message that you can see the type for the uh, the input and the type for the return. These are domain objects. These do not have anything to do with Elasticsearch or anything else. So we pass Elasticsearch data inside Elasticsearch uh, module and then we pass the domain object back. So 
here you can also see a no search implementation so this is actually just a simple it returns empty arrays etc it it has no effect so you can configure whichever you want to use if you don't want to use no if you don't want to use a search engine a no search will be created so let me just show the basic implementation this is a factory that i created for this presentation so as you can see um it depends on the logger this again this again is an external external service so here you can see this my search engine has no idea which logger i am going to use so i am passing um, an interface and in turn my search engine builder or factory also returns a, a an interface for the search engine which you saw in the previous slide so in this factory i decide by configuration which i want to use if elasticsearch is mentioned i create an elasticsearch client etc and return an elasticsearch search engine which complies with this interface if elasticsearch is not mentioned then we just send back a no search engine so the project will still work wherever you have for example a search engine implementation you don't have to do any if else anything you just change the factory nothing else you include uh, for example you have abc search engine so you include the abc search engine module you uh, edit the builder you just create a case for the builder and the team can configure to use abc search engine and they will have it and if you just plug and play everything it the configuration will look like this so this is a sample configuration that can be uh, used so the search engine is mentioned as elastic search and you provide the elastic search part for the configuration you can also um, pass any extra extra information if you want for example the analyzer etc and in this way you can basically replace any, uh, any external service that you want that you want to so moving on um, this was the end of basically the architecture part and now i move on to a very crucial part for a chat any kind of chat application so um, we decided to go with pusher but again it resides behind an abstraction so you can replace it and we, we decided to go with pusher channels because we were familiar with it and um, it just uses basic basic web sockets but here i want to mention another thing we didn't want the front end or the or the client side team to have any kind of headache with integrating pusher we wanted them to just use our sdk and they will have pusher web sockets integrated with it so in the web sockets as well, in the sdk as well we have this abstraction so client side developers do not have to know uh, pusher content or uh, know that how to bind to a pusher channel etc they just use a generic interface and use generic bind or connect and whatever underlying underlying real time notification system is used that will be implemented or that will be invoked we also have uh, we also build push notification system to our software so we use firebase cloud, cloud messaging so one can ask why did you use two why didn't you just combine and use firebase so we decided to use two in uh, in the sense that firebase push notification has some limitations so firebase has this data limitation of i think 4 kilobytes and also some limitations with regarding to guaranteed delivery or uh, how fast the delivery will be so we wanted the real time part to kick in when you have the app open so when you whenever you have the app open you will be connected to a web socket and you will get messages in real time but whenever you have the app closed or in those mode then we, we then you will have the push notification uh, part which will be active and you will get the messages in push notification so i want to also add that um, in in developing the push notification part i found some uh, i found some differences between android and ios 
So uh, that that uh, you should also keep in mind if you want to um, build push notification systems, which you want cross-platform, but in a single system. Also for push notification, we manage the device tokens on our own in our system. So we have this uh, user user push notification I uh, push notification settings, and we also have user devices. So the client side uh, basically connects and disconnects the push uh, Firebase push notification devices. So whenever they register a device, we use the device token, or whenever they unregister, we use the device token in that case. Um, and also we we went ahead with a notification settings. So it has a generic, um, I'm really sorry, I did not include that in the slide. So uh, it has a generic method called should notify. So in this method, basically the system searches the user's settings and decides whether to notify or not. So this is another uh, important topic. Since our service is an external service, but it sits right beside any main, a major API. So the API might also be interested in uh, events that go on or events that happen. So we used Redis to create queues and set uh, the events there so that any other uh, external API a, a, that is connected to the same Redis cluster can also get these events delivered to them. They can also, they can listen, they can poll or they can listen to events. And if, and if there is, uh, and also there is another thing, they have to manage their own queues. So this is also documented that how you have to create or manage the queue. And if you create the queue in a certain way, you will have the specific event delivered to you. So in this case, uh, doing this, basically each API or each service will have their own queue so that um, if something goes down, they will have these messages in queue and they can do whatever they want. For example, they might want to send an email uh, when there is a new message or they, want to, they might want to update a user information uh, based on a chat messaging event so that is um basically th that is basically it so my i hope you guys enjoyed this talk and i hope um i could show you something interesting and something new so yeah back to you Chandni. thank you tanvir um i think we have a question in the comments Roxana is asking if there's any limitations when using Node.js in this kind of solution. Yeah, so a limitation that I can think of um, is when, so we build this as a hosted system, right? But when we want to deploy it in a client's um, infrastructure, so this cannot be created as a binary or as a bundled uh, software. So we have, since it's a scripted language, we have to provide the um, code, etc., with it. So that is one limitation that I can think of. Great. Um, another question that's come in from Saad. Um, what were the challenges that about the SDK maintaining? Yeah, so SDK maintenance, uh, what can I say? So uh, in terms of NDM, in terms of NPM, you know, things change very, very fast. So all of your packages can get outdated really fast and they can, like the APIs can also get deprecated and they might have audit vulnerabilities. So, and fixing those can, can prove to be a challenge sometimes. Great. Um, there's a lot of appreciation and love for you uh, in the comments. There's also one question that uh, Fahim is asking. Uh, is there any plan uh, to have encryption feature on messaging? That is a great question and a great feature um, that you have requested. So we will definitely think about it. We did think about it previously, but since 
our systems uh, at the moment do not require encrypt like end-to-end -end encryption so we decided not to go with it so in terms of end-to-end -end encryption we might go directly through redis or directly through something like kafka and not store the messages at all all right great um i think that's really all the questions we've covered everything thank you so much tanvir um for your time and thank you for sharing your knowledge um thanks to all the audience for your questions and comments um i'm gonna say bye to tanvir now all right thanks, bye bye thank you very much